This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Two The Ancient Times. Book Two, Chapter Six The Dragon of Alca. The chapter begins with a quote from the memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Paris, 1843, Volume 4, pages 404 and 405. We afterwards went to visit the Cabinet of Natural History. The caretaker showed us a sort of packet bound in straw that he told us contained the skeleton of a dragon. A proof, added he, that the dragon is not a fabulous animal. And the chapter begins. In the meantime, the inhabitants of Alca practiced the labors of peace. Those of the northern coast went in boats to fish or to search for shellfish. The laborers of Dombey cultivated oats, rye, and wheat. The rich penguins of the Valley of Delay reared domestic animals, while those of the Bay of Divers cultivated their orchards. Merchants of Port Alca carried on a trade in salt fish with Armorica, and the gold of the two Britons, which began to be introduced into the island, facilitated exchange. The penguin people were enjoying the fruits of their labors in perfect tranquillity, when suddenly a sinister rumor ran from village to village. It was said everywhere that a frightful dragon had ravaged two farms in the Bay of Divers. A few days before the maiden Orborosia had disappeared. Her absence had at first caused no uneasiness, because on several occasions she had been carried off by violent men who were consumed with love and thoughtful people were not astonished at this, reflecting that the maiden was the most beautiful of the penguins. It was even remarked that she sometimes went to meet her ravishers, for none of us can escape his destiny. But this time, as she did not return, it was feared that the dragon had devoured her, the more so as the inhabitants of the Valley of Delay soon knew that the dragon was not a fable told by the women around the fountains, for one night the monster devoured out of the village of Annis six hens, a sheep, and a young orphan child called Little Elo. The next morning nothing was to be found, either of the animals or of the child. Immediately the elders of the village assembled in the public place, and seated themselves on the stone bench, to take counsel concerning what was expedient to do in these terrible circumstances. Having called all those penguins who had seen the dragon during the disastrous night, they asked them, have you not noticed his form and his behavior? And each answered, in his turn, He has the claws of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and the tail of a serpent. His back bristles with thorny crests. His whole body is covered with yellow scales. His look fascinates and confounds. He vomits flames. He poisons the air with his breath. He has the head of a dragon, the claws of a lion, and the tail of a fish and a woman of Annis, who was regarded as intelligent and of sound judgment, and from whom the dragon had taken three hens, deposed as follows. Well, he, he is formed like a man. The proof is that I thought he was my husband, and I said to him, Come to bed, you old fool. Others said, He is formed like a cloud. He looks like a mountain. And a little child came and said, I saw the dragon taking off his head in the barn so that he might give a kiss to my sister Minnie. And the elders also asked the inhabitants, How big is the dragon? And it was answered, As big as an ox, like the big merchant ships of the Bretons. He is the height of a man. He is higher than the fig tree under which you are sitting. He is as large as a dog. Questioned finally on his color, the inhabitants said, Red, green, blue, yellow. His head is bright green. His wings are brilliant orange tinged with pink. His limbs are silver gray. His hind quarters and his tail are striped with brown and pink bands. His belly bright yellow spotted with black. His color? He has no color. Uh, he is the, the color of a, a, a dragon. After hearing this evidence, the elders remained uncertain as to what should be done. Some advised to watch for him to surprise him and overthrow him by a multitude of arrows. Others, thinking it vain to oppose so powerful a monster by force, counseled 
that he should be appeased by offerings. "'Pay him tribute,' said one of them who passed for a wise man. "'We can render him propitious to us by giving him agreeable presents, fruit, wine, lambs, a young virgin.' Others held for poisoning the fountains where he was accustomed to drink, or for smoking him out of his cavern. But none of these counsels prevailed. The dispute was lengthy, and the elders dispersed without coming to any resolution. End of chapter 6